I was praying this week, Lord, what do you want me to, to preach on? The Lord showed me uh, the foundation of a house. And I, I knew what he wanted. Just, just that. So let me go back to the beginning. When I was a young man, about Nick's age, or Brad's age, I worked for a contractor. <clears throat> Uh, he was a general contractor. We did everything from house remodeling to you know, uh, restoring a kitchen to building entire houses. And when we built entire houses, we always had to start with the foundation. And the first question the homeowner had to decide was whether or not they wanted a basement. So let's assume that they did not want a basement. Well, then we had to dig a foundation trench, lay it out according to the dimensions of the house. And it was, if I remember correctly, about two feet wide and about 18 inches or more deep. And it went around the area where the house was going to be built on. And then cement was poured into that foundation. And before the cement set, you see these long things called anchor bolts were laid in the cement at so certain intervals all the way around the four sides of that foundation. And then later on, when we would build the frame of the house, we'd do one side at a time, and we would put it up. There were holes drilled in the bottom of the wooden frame of each wall of the house, and they would go over those anchor bolts, and then we would bolt each of the walls down to the foundation. Then you would set up the four walls, and you would nail the four walls together thus securing the frame of the house. Everything depended on that foundation. Now to show you how important this is, Jesus gave several sermons on the same thing. And basically what he said was, you have to make sure that you build your house on the foundation of rock, solid rock or concrete. Do not build your house on shifting sand. And then he said in both instances, a storm is coming. And that storm is going to beat against the house. And the house that is built on sand, that sand is going to be washed away by the flood waters of the storm, or by the, the rain water. And that house is going to collapse because there's no foundation, and so the sand is going to be washed away and the house is going to tilt. He said the fall of that house is going to be very big, very great. But for the wise person, for the wise person who builds their house on solid rock or concrete, when the storms come, now you notice he didn't say if a storm comes. He said, when the storm comes and beats against that house, that house will stand. You all get the point? So when the Lord showed me the foundation of a house, I said, okay, Father, I know what you want me to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back and I'm going to lay the foundation of your faith. Because as it says in the book of Hebrews, once more, God is going to shake not only the heavens, but the earth. Now, he shook the heavens once. There was a big battle in heaven. And there was a war between angels and angels. And you all should know this story. And he said, once more, I'm going to shake not only the heavens, but the earth. <clears throat> now, when God says in the book of Hebrews, he's going to shake the earth, a lot of people take that literally. So, fine. Once more, we can expect a massive physical shaking of the planet Earth. <laughs> but I hope you all understand that he was speaking primarily spiritually. And what God was saying is, once more, I'm going to shake the Earth spiritually until, until what? Until everything that can be shaken is going to be shaken and collapse. And the only thing left are those things which cannot be shaken and collapsed, which are our houses of faith, because they were built on what? On what? The rock. 
By the way, the rock is one of the names for God. The rock is one of the names for Jesus. There are songs that we've sung that talk about the rock. Okay. So we're going to go back and we're going to build your foundation because as I've said since February of 2020, I started preaching in February and then in March we started putting a video and so you can go back and you can look at all the sermons from March of 2020 when the pandemic really started exploding. I told you all then and I'm going to remind you all now that the birth pangs of the return of Jesus have begun because that was a signal event that shook the entire world, did it not? Yes. We're still feeling the effects today. Um, have any of you heard this, this phrase, this word, inflation? Yeah. They trace it all the way back to the pandemic and the supply lines being stopped because there were lockdowns across the planet. And because there were lockdowns, goods weren't being moved. Because goods weren't being moved, things went up in price. There was, a, there was a limited availability, and, and the list just went on and on and on. And so that shock led to another shock, which led to another shock. And then the latest was in February of this year when Russia invaded Ukraine. I told you that was another birth bag. Now, you all need to know that up to 40 million tons of grain are exported by Russia and Ukraine every year. But that's not going to happen this year. And up to 400 million people are estimated to go hungry this year or starve to death because of this war. And I have told you that I believe it's the beginning of World War III. I don't see what I'm crazy about. But shock after shock after shock tells me to tell you the Lord God is shaking the earth. You all get the picture? And it's not going to get better. And the enemy is at war with God, and the enemy is trying to do everything he can to shape your faith, to get you to turn away from God and to follow the path of the world. And we're not going to do that, are we? So what we're going to do is we're going to start, and I'm going to go over the book of Romans. And we're going to start from the beginning. And I'm going to fly literally fly to the book of Romans. Now to give you some example of why I said we're going to fly to the book of Romans, it's 16 chapters. It is the primary theological book of the Bible. Let me say that again. The book of Romans is the primary theological book of the Bible. If you understand the book of Romans, you understand the Bible. And if you understand the Bible, you've built your house of faith on concrete, on the rock. It is that important. Martin Luther, the father of the Reformation, when he read the book of Romans for the first time in the original language, he, he understood. He finally got it. Up to that point, he was a Catholic priest of the Augustinian order. There are different... There are different sections of priesthoods within the Catholic Church. They all follow certain leaders. You have some who followed this man named Francis of Assisi. And they were called the Franciscans. And they took, they take vows of poverty and chastity, for example. And then there are others who follow St. Augustine. And he, he was a great intellectual theologian of the 4th century A.D. And so amongst the Catholic priests, they had these different orders, and up until he got into the Book of Romans, Martin Luther was just an Augustinian monk, a priest of the order of Augustine within the Catholic Church. And when he read the Book of Romans, God opened his eyes, and he got it. And that's what started the entire Reformation that has led to the Christian Church 1,500 years, 500 years later, to where we're at today. And he said, Martin Luther said, the Book of Romans is the chiefest book of the Bible. 
If Satan could destroy every book of the Bible, every Bible in existence, Mark Luther said, if Satan could destroy every Bible in existence, and only the Gospel of John and the letter of Paul to the Romans were saved, Christianity would be saved. The Gospel of John, which we've gone over, and the book of Romans. That is how important this book is. It is the chiefest theology book to explain what God has done from beginning to end that's ever been penned. The most important book you'll ever read. 16 chapters, the book of Romans. I want to start encouraging you all to do that. So, my favorite theologian of the past 500 years was a cardiologist in England by the name of Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones. Phenomenally meticulous theologian. He wrote a commentary on the Book of Romans. Sixteen books. One book, two to three hundred pages for every chapter of the Book of Romans. And he preached on the Book of Romans at his church in London. Are you ready for this? Twice a week for 13 years. Morning and night. And every lesson was a different lesson for 13 years. And I don't believe we have 13 years left, number one. And number two, I am not as articulate as Dr. Jones is. So when I say I'm going to fly through the Book of Romans, I mean we're going to whiz through it. And it's up to you all. If you want your faith on a solid rock, it's up to you all to read and understand the book of Romans. And I'm going to whiz through it, and I'm going to try to help you lay that foundation. I'm going to give you the framework, just like building that house. We're going to lay the concrete foundation, and then we're going to put up the walls, and then we're going to put in the wiring, and we're going to put in the windows, and we're going to put it on the roof, and so on. We're building a house of faith. Okay? We're going to do that through the book of Romans. It is that important, because what's coming down the road Listen to me, all of you. I'm trying to. I'm trying to make you a little nervous inside. What's coming down the road in this world at this time is going to shape your faith, and God is going to allow this in order so that anything of your faith that's weak collapses. Because your Father in Heaven doesn't want any of you or me to have weak, shaky faith. We are going to have to have the same faith that Noah had in his day. We are going to have to have the same faith that Lot had in his day. That's what Jesus said. When the Son of Man returns, will he find faith? Remember Noah. He said, remember Lot. So they, when they went through their earth-shaking time, their faith didn't waver. So that's what we're going to do. This is a very famous verse from the Bible. You've probably not read it this way, but I'm going to explain to you as we go in the coming weeks and months. I'm going to explain to you why this is such an important verse. It's from the 17th verse of chapter 1 of Romans. He who is righteous by faith shall live. Now, in most of your translations, that's not the way it's translated. And I'll get into that in the coming weeks, and we'll get into some detail. Because most of them will say, but the righteous shall live by faith. But the righteous shall live by faith is a little bit different than he who is righteous by faith shall live, isn't it? And together I'm going to show you why you need to understand what that phrase means and why God had Paul pen it down that way and how Paul wrote the entire book of Romans around that right there. That's the key to the book of Romans. And unfortunately, the vast majority of people who read and teach Romans never get the key. So you're all going to get the key. So let me start with the very first verse, just the introduction. Now, Paul's letters, like most of the letters you read 
Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and so on. It starts off from somebody to somebody, greetings. In this case, it's from Paul to the people, to the believers in Rome, greetings. And I'm not going to go through all that, but I wanted to start you off here because even the first verse is just loaded. Number one, Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, a called apostle, set apart for the good message of God. Now it starts off and says, Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus. In your nice new translations, it's not politically correct today to use the word slave. So most of your translations, if you have your Bible, you can open up to Romans 1.1. 1, 1. <clears throat> most of your translations will say, Paul, a bond servant of Christ Jesus. Look at that. Or grab the Bible in front of you. Or Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. The word in Greek is slave, and it means just what you picture as slave. Paul identified himself as the slave of Christ Jesus. He was the slave, Jesus was the master, and the master told the slave where to go, what to do, and so on and so forth. And, and the slave had what choice in the matter? Zero. So when Paul calls himself a slave of Christ Jesus, what he is saying is, Jesus made me a slave on your behalf. And I go where my master tells me to go, and I say what my master tells me to say, and it is for your good, and I am so glad that I am his slave. I am a called apostle. Your translation might say, called as an apostle. But that word that I've underlined called is an adjective. Remember your English grammar? Adjectives are words that describe nouns. Now I can see a lot of heads going, yeah. <laughs> But you're going to learn your English. You're going to learn your grammar. An adjective describes a noun. Adverbs describe verbs. Remember that? So Paul says, I am an apostle. That's a noun, a person who has been sent by somebody else. That's a, the word apostle simply means a sent one. I have been sent by God, but he says, I am a called apostle, meaning somebody called him to go do this. Who called him? Who, who called Paul? St. Lazarus. The Lord called him. And later on he's going to say, to the saints in Rome, you, to the Christians, who were also called by God. You think, you may be thinking that you're sitting here this morning for this reason and that reason. Oh, I've got nothing else to do. Let's go to church today. Oh, well, I've got to go to church today because that's what we do on Sunday morning. Oh, da 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 and So we're, we're, we're sitting here in these pews this morning because not realizing that you're sitting here because sometime in your life, the Holy Spirit called you into the kingdom of heaven. So you are also a called person of God. So when you see that word called in the New Testament, let your spiritual ears perk up and say, that means more than just simply, hey, Chris, what are you doing back there? That's not the type of call we're talking about. We're talking about God calling you into his kingdom. So Paul is a slave of Christ Jesus. He is a called apostle. Then he was set apart for the good message of God. He was set apart. Remember how many times I've told you in the last several years here? This is the world. I want you to picture this. I know I'm coarse. I know I'm gross. But this is the language the Bible uses because God sometimes uses extremely coarse language to get the point across to us dull humans. This is the world. It is a giant cesspool. Y'all know what a cesspool is? Hello? Yes. Okay, well, we're the floaters in the cesspool. 
That's what God said. Don't look at me. If you need me to point out some coarse language in the Bible, see me after church and we'll go over it and I'll shock you. Trust me, I'll shock you. And God picks up some of us lousy floaters from over there and says, you know what? I'm going to save you. I'm going to clean you up. And I'm going to adopt you into my family and make you my son or daughter. I'm going to set you apart for my kingdom. That's what that word means, set apart. You were over here, and God in his grace and mercy decided to open your ears, your spiritual ears, and make you hear the good message that there is eternal life, and God's going to give it to you as his gift. You, therefore, every one of you sitting in these pews, you have been set apart by God. So Paul, who was set apart by God, is writing to others who have been set apart by God. Set apart for the good message of God. The good message of God. Which God promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. This message that Paul's writing to the Roman church was laid out, this good message was laid out in the scriptures beforehand by the prophets. And all Paul is going to do is he's going to bring together the threads of this good message. And he's going to lay it out for them so that they will understand finally and they will have their faith on the rock because the Roman church would, as you know from history, the Roman church would go through years of persecution. Can anybody tell me what happened to the early people in the Church of Rome? From your history books, from what you heard in Sunday school, from maybe what you read? Bird? What happened to the early Christians in Rome? Bird? What? Some of them burned? Some of them were burned. Nero, the emperor of Rome, during the time of Paul and Peter, the apostles, the emperor Nero used to grab Christians up from their churches wrap them up in rags, douse them with olive oil, pin them against the walls of the streets, and light them on fire and use them as torches. How would you like that as a way to die? Let me say it again. To be grabbed out of the church, just like this, to be hauled off to jail, to be wrapped like a mummy in rags, doused with olive oil, till you're just soaking in these oil-soaked rags, then to be tied up and burned alive and used as human torches at night. Is that a pretty picture? No. Hello? No. What else happened to the early Christians? Say it louder, I can't hear you. They were sent to the Coliseum. The Coliseum was a big sports arena like our NFL football stadiums, where 50,000 or more people would watch gladiators fight to the death because they were bored, you know, and they, you know. First it was wrestling, then it was fighting, and then it was fighting to the death, and they got gorier and gorier. And finally, the emperor, in order to keep the population happy, started taking Christians and throwing them into this arena and then letting loose lions and tigers and bears. Women, children, old people, in the middle of this arena, and then the doors would be opened up, and these hungry lions and tigers would eat. I was like that, like that. Hello? Me a slingshot. Yeah, I wouldn't help you too much. Twenty lions and one slingshot. Good luck, Barbara. <laughs> but they weren't even given slingshots. My point is that. Paul wrote this letter to the church knowing that they were going to go through hard times. Okay? And he wanted their faith to be rock solid. Don't deny Jesus with what's coming down the road. The prophets of old had laid out this good message and Paul's going to bring it all together to strengthen their faith. This good message is concerning his son who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh. So this message that starts in Genesis goes forward 
was concerning a man who was born in the flesh, who was a descendant of King David. He was a Jewish man. Who is declared also the what? The Bible doesn't say Jesus is the Son of God. The Bible doesn't claim that Jesus is the Son of God. I've heard that. A lot of atheists, a lot of people, different cults and whatever, who want to deny the divinity of Jesus say, no word does the Bible say Jesus is the Son of God. Hello? And that's what they'll tell you over and over again. Read that again. Who is declared the what? Son of God. Hello? Jesus said, I and my Father are one. And thus they picked up stones to stone him. Why would the Pharisees pick up stones to stone him? Because he said he and his father were one. Because he was, as the scripture says, he was making himself evil to God. And Paul says, not only was he born of the flesh, but he was declared by the Father to be the Son of God with power by what? Resurrection. The resurrection from the dead. This was God's way of telling the whole world, this my son of the flesh is also my son in truth. He was raised from the dead. Death has no power in God's kingdom. Aren't you glad? Yes. According to the spirit of holiness, and in case you're not sure who I'm talking about, Paul says, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now we're going to skip. Like I said, we're going to... I'm just giving you the, the framework today, the outline, the basic four walls of this house we're building. Zoom, zoom, very fast. We're going to go back and we're going to fill it in. Paul says, For I'm not ashamed of the good message, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. This message that I'm giving you, Paul says, is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Now that's a strange way to put it. But very quickly, what Paul is saying is there are two groups of people in the world. There are the Jews, and there are the Gentiles. The Jews and the Greeks. Now he's not talking about literally ethnic Greeks. He's saying anybody who's not a Jew is, is a Gentile, is a Greek, um, another one, barbarian. You're either a Jew or you're a non-Jew. There you go. And if you read the Old Testament, you understand that God separated the Jews from all the peoples of the earth, set them apart. And here's the world of all these different ethnic groups, and here are the Jews. And Paul is saying, this good message of salvation is for everyone, to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. Now we're going to see as we get down the line here, Paul is going to say, ah, that sword, to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile, cuts both ways. When God punishes, he says, to the Jew first, and to the Gentile. So to the Jew first is a, is a nice thing, but it's also a harsh thing when punishment comes. But you can see that over and over again. To the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. To the Jew first, and also to the barbarian. To the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For in it, this good message that I'm going to tell you, Paul says, for in it, this good message, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, now I'm giving it to you the, the way that Paul translated it here for his purposes, because he's in the next 15 chapters explaining this one little verse from a little prophet in the Old Testament called Habakkuk. This is from the prophet Habakkuk. But the righteous by faith shall live. Now again, in most translations, in your Bibles, when you read it, yours might say, 
but the righteous shall live by faith. Now, I want you to look at these two very carefully so you understand the difference. The first one says, the righteous by faith shall live. And the key word in both top and bottom phrases is that word faith. Do we link it with live? Live by faith? Or do we link it with the righteous person by faith? See, that is the key to the book of Romans. Is that the righteous person shall live? Let's link the word shall live by faith. Or is it he who is righteous by faith shall live? See, that is what you all need to understand. And that is why this is so important. And as we're going to see over and over again in the book of Romans, over and over again, we're going to see the word righteous linked with faith. Not live by faith, but he who is righteous by faith. Because you and I are not going to walk through the pearly gates because we are such righteous people. Because we're not. I've told you that many times before. Paul's going to lay it all out for us very slowly, very carefully, very meticulously, and he's going to pound that nail into the wood so there's no doubt in your mind or my mind that this is what God wants us to understand. The one who is righteous by faith shall live. That is the message that Paul wrote to the church of Rome. The person who is righteous by faith, not by deeds. The person who is righteous by faith is the person who shall live. And he's going to then start a chapter from that point on. He's going to start chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, and right on through. And the last half, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, he's going to say how we should live. Okay, briefly this morning, starting chapter 1, Paul tells us that Gentiles are not righteous people. He says the wrath of God is being poured out on the Gentiles because of their unrighteousness. Now as I look around the room here, I don't see a lot of Jewish people. I see a lot of Gentiles. Maybe you're from this ethnic group, maybe you're from that ethnic group. It doesn't matter. If you're not from the Jewish ethnic group, you're a Gentile. In chapter 1, Paul starts from verse 17 going forward, and he's going to make a very particular point. From God's perspective, from God's eyes, Gentile people are not righteous people. We live very unholy, ungodly lives. A lot of stuff comes out of our mouth that should A lot of things we do we shouldn't be doing. And from God's holy, perfect perspective, as a whole, the entire planet, throughout all time, all humans are unrighteous. All of us, Gentiles. Now you can imagine when Paul wrote this letter, the Jews who were part of the church in Rome, because remember the church was started by Jews, the Jewish part of the church in Rome probably read this letter saying, yeah, Brother Paul, tell them. Tell those Gentile Romans and Greeks and, and heathens just how unrighteous they are. And he did. God says that Gentiles, as a rule, are very unrighteous. But then he gets to chapter 2. And he turns his guns on the Jewish, his Jewish brethren. And he says, and you know what? You all are unrighteous too. Now that would have been a shock to his Jewish brethren who were reading this letter from Paul. What do you mean we're unrighteous too? And he's going to go through and he's going to systematically show the Jewish people that from God's eyes, from God's throne, you too are unrighteous. So again, that division, we have the Gentile people of the world, and we have the Jewish people of the world. And Paul starts off in chapter 1 and says, all of these people over here 
are unrighteous, unholy, deserving of the wrath of God. Then in chapter 2, he turns to this group that was set apart over here and said, You're unrighteous too, all of you. You think you're righteous because you have the law. But you're no more righteous than these people. And he's going to go into detail. We're not going to do that this morning. He's going to go into detail to show both Jews and Gentiles are unrighteous in the eyes of God. Here's Paul's point. Huh. Who's righteous in God's sight? No one. Hello? No one is righteous in God's sight. Not Jew, not Gentile, no human. Chapter 1, Gentiles unrighteous. Chapter 2, Jewish people unrighteous. Chapter 3, Paul goes on. He's going to verify to the readers that these claims that he's making, that no one is righteous in God's eyes, he's going to verify and say, now, you may be reading this and you might be thinking, this Paul is really wild, or he's really mean, or he's really whatever. But to, to, to buttress his position, to show the truth of his claims, Paul goes back to the scriptures. And he says, you want proof of what I'm saying? This is the truth of God? Look here, look here, look here, look here. And he's going to use Scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture. And we're going to get down there, we're going to see that, we'll read that down the road in chapter 3. To make the point that God says, there's no one who's righteous in my eyes. None of you. Zero. So he starts by putting all of his humans face down on the floor. Get your faces on the floor before the Holy God because you're an unrighteous human being, all of you. That's where Paul puts us all equally. At the end of chapter 3, after he says, there's no one who's righteous, not Gentiles, not Jews, no one. He says, you all may be trying to live a very holy life. You all are trying to do the right thing. Or you're not succeeding. And from God's point of view, you're doing a mighty poor job of it. So am I. We all are. But he says, but now, now I'm going to show you a different way. I'm going to show you how you can get right in God's eyes. This is what Paul wrote. But now a righteousness from God, apart from law, apart from commands, apart from do this and don't do this and do this and don't do that, a righteousness that comes from God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. So what Paul is saying is there is a way to get right in God's eyes for all of us humans. And Paul includes himself. How do we get right with God how do we get right in God's eyes if it's not by carrying out a system of commands and laws, do this and do this and do this, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. Paul says, it was there all along. It was there all along. We didn't get the message. So God has sent me to give you the message, Paul says. So now, a righteousness that comes from God, apart from the law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God, it comes through what? Faith. It comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. You want to be right with God? It comes by having faith in somebody or something. And Paul tells us who that somebody or something is, doesn't he, right there? By faith in who? Jesus Christ. Look it up there and read it, people. Jesus Put it, build your foundation, your house on it. I'd like to get to the well, we got to get there slowly. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. I'm in the third chapter of Romans now. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. This Salvation, this righteousness from God, comes by faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. 
There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. And then that most famous verse in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that you all should know. Are you ready? Do I hear some? Mm -hmm. I've heard that before. <laughs> Hello? Yes? No? Yes. Yes. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Being declared righteous or being justified as a what? Yeah. As a what? Yeah. As a gift. By His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. We are declared righteous in God's eyes as a what? Yeah. As a what? Yeah. Yeah. What is that? What's a gift? Hello? I know these are hard questions. <laughs> it's hot outside. And it's hard to think. <laughs> Thank you. The gift is what? Great. Something that is given, that is free, that is not earned. Because if I earn something, that's my wages. If I work for something and then my employer gives me money, that's not a gift. I worked for it. But if somebody just gives me something freely, that's a gift. That gift is given by God's favor, His grace. And that word grace means undeserved favor, meaning we unrighteous people didn't deserve it, but He's just going to lay it on me. He's going to lay it on Mike. He's going to lay it on Vanessa. He's going to lay it on them. They don't deserve it, but he's just going to give it to them. All they need to do is reach out and take it. That's a gift. You all get that point? Does he have to do 500 Hail Marys and 400 Our Fathers and go to church 17 times a day for the rest of his life to get that gift? No. See, that would be work. Does he have to read... Ten chapters of the Bible every day in order to get that gift? No. Does he even have to be able to quote the book of Galatians to get that gift? No. What does he have to do to get that gift? Take it. Leave it. Thank you. And take it. That's a gift. And Paul says this righteousness, this right step, he is not in right standing with God if he just reaches out and takes that gift. What is that gift? Believe in my son Jesus, God says. Trust that he did everything necessary to secure your salvation. Trust in him. And never let him go. Is that a good message of what? Yes. Our redemption, our salvation is a gift of God. Now that word redemption means to be redeemed. When you first sinned your first sin, you sold yourself into slavery. First lie you ever told, you bound yourself to the other. You were sold into slavery to Satan. Sorry. First time you cussed. The first time you rebelled against your mother or father. The first time you coveted that other kid's toy. The first time you sinned, you became enslaved to Satan in the world. And Jesus comes and says, I'm taking them back. I'm buying them back. And Satan says, and do you know the cost to buy her back? Pay attention to that. I don't want to look up. <laughs> do you know the cost to buy her back, Satan tells Jesus? Blood, life, life for life. She's mine. She belongs to me. Her soul belongs to me. She sold her soul to me when she sinned. I own her. And Jesus says, I'll buy her back. And he says, the cost for her life is life. Do you all get the point? Life for life. And Jesus says, I'll give my life for her life. And Satan thought, boy, did he win this battle? So, we have been redeemed, bought back out of slavery, 
by Jesus Christ because we sold ourselves into slavery by sin. Our redemption, our being bought out of slavery back into the freedom of the children of God, our entire salvation is a gift of God. Not as a result of our good deeds or our good works. When Carol Brown sinned her first sin and all the subsequent sins that Carol Brown ever committed bound her in eternal chains and she was destined for the pit of hell to, to spend the rest of eternity in a dark, lonely, hot, alone place forever with no parole at all, Jesus stepped forward and said, I will pay the price. Aren't you glad he did it for you? Now, Carol Brown, in her chains, what was that question about? What was redemption? Redemption being bought back. When something is sold and you buy it back. Like at the pawn shop. Think about that way. When Carol Brown was bound in her chains, Carol Brown could have talked from now until she died, telling the enemy, telling Satan, I want, I want him to go free. What do I need to do to go free? What do you think he's going to tell her? Sorry. Say it louder. You're mine. What can I give you to go free? Not the, what could you, what could Carol Brown do for Satan so that he would release her from that bondage? Answer. Nothing. What if I go to church every Sunday? Oh yeah, I'm going to let you free for that. What if I read the Bible every day? Oh yeah, I'm going to let you free for that. What if I say certain prayers? What if I, what if I spend the rest of my life on my knees? I don't care, Satan says. You belong to me. Jesus had to come and free Carol Brown. Jesus had to die for you and for me. Did you all get that point? Hello? Yes. And there's nothing you could have done to get set free from that bondage. God says, I had a way from the very beginning when I looked through the quarter of time and I saw that Adam and Eve were going to sin and all their descendants were going to rebel against me and that all of them were going to sin. I had this plan from the very beginning. I will send to my son to pay the price for their rebellion. Chapter 1. Gentiles are unrighteous. Chapter 2, Jewish people are unrighteous. Chapter 3, you're all unrighteous. And not only am I telling you this, I'm going to show you that this is what God says in His Word. Verse after verse after verse after verse. It is written, it is written, it is written, it is written. But God has provided a way. We get to chapter 4, and Paul says, You want more proof? that what I'm telling you is the good message. I'm going to show you that the way you get right with God is by having faith, not by doing certain deeds. And I'm going to give you two examples from the Bible to show you that what I'm telling you is true. Number one is Father Abraham. It is said of him, do you remember the story in Genesis? God tells Father Abraham, who at that time had no children. Go out, look up at the night sky, count the stars if you can. I'm gonna, you're going to have so many descendants, they're going to be like the stars of the night sky. You won't be able to count them all. What did Abraham have to do to receive that blessing? The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 15, Abraham looked up, saw the stars, and the sky says, and Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham believed it was credited to him as righteousness. Paul says, do you see, it was there from Genesis going forward. Ah, you want more proof, Paul says, chapter 4? You want more proof, look at David. David writes the book of Psalms. David. God's choice for king. David the brave, David the warrior, David the faithful, David the prophet, David the singer of psalms. 
he wrote a lot of songs to God, praising God. The beloved of God. That's what David means, beloved. David checks out the girl next door, says, hey, hey, hey. She is good. She's in a bath. She doesn't have any clothes on. She's looking good. Her husband's away. The cat will play. And he gets her pregnant. Gee, he commits adultery. He impregnates another man's wife. Now he's got to cover it up because the penalty for adultery is death. So how's he going to cover it up? How, how's he going to keep that secret sin hidden? I know. He's going to bring the husband back from the front lines, have him lie with his wife, and then when she tells him several months down the road, hey, do you remember when you came home from the front lines? Well, guess what? I'm pregnant. And sin will be covered so many other things. Did it work out? No. Husband won't lie with his wife. All my fellow soldiers are out in the field and they're sacrificing for this war. I'm not. I'm not going to sleep with my wife. Dang it, David says. Now we're around here. Tries to get the man drunk. Come home, sleep with your wife. Man won't do it. So finally, David writes a letter to the general in charge of the battle. It says, the guy who's carrying this letter, put him in the front lines and make sure he's killed. David has Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, murdered. That David, God's favorite, God's beloved. David writes a couple of songs. And one of them says, how beautiful it is, how great it is to the man whose sins are not counted against him. What? David believed that God had provided a way for his, David's, sins to be paid for. David believed it. And it was credited to him as righteous. He didn't do anything. How can you unring the bell, people? How do you unring the bell if you murder somebody? Hello? You can't unring that bell. How do you unring the bell when you steal from somebody. You stole from them. Even if you take it back, did you steal from them originally? Hello? Yeah. Yes? If I gossip about you, if I gossip to somebody else, and I tell somebody something bad about you, I can't unring that bell. Because I have put bad thoughts about you in somebody else's head. See? And yet, God has provided a way for us to be righteous in His eyes by laying all that guilt and penalty on Jesus for us. Aren't you glad He did that? Hello? <sighs> Carol Brown is not going to have to spend eternity in a dark, hot, dry, lonely place. Aren't you glad? Yes. With no chance of parole ever. But there are a lot of people out there who are rebellious, shake their fist to God, don't have anything to do with them, want to do what I want. Hey, go for it. I would want to be you, and if that's what you want to do, go for it. Now, having shown us how we are righteous by faith in Jesus Christ. See how Paul starts chapter 5. Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 5. What comes after chapter 4? Chapter 5. Let's read the first verse of chapter 5. Therefore, therefore means from everything I've told you up to this point, therefore, I've laid this foundation, I've showed you this, therefore, Therefore what? Therefore, having been justified or declared righteous, same word in the Greek, having been declared righteous by what? Do you see the link? Righteous faith. Hello? Being declared righteous how? By faith, Paul says. 
Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have what? Peace. Yes. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe this is the message you came to hear this morning. I don't know. Maybe there's somebody sitting here this morning who still doesn't feel quite at peace with God. You're still thinking he's mad at you. You're still thinking that maybe he's holding a wee little grudge against you. You need to read your word. Your Father in Heaven is telling you over and over and over again. And now he's telling you to Brother Don, listen to me all. If you are trusting my son Jesus for your salvation, we have peace. We're at peace, beloved. Peace. Isn't that a great message? Yes. The word is not truce. We have a truce with God. No, he didn't say we have a truce with God. What is a truce? Anyway, what's a truce? Versus, thank you. A truce is when there's a war going on and a battle going on, and one side or the other calls a truce, they put up a flag and say, time out. Time's easy. And the fighting stops for a little while. That's a truce. That's not peace. You all get it? It's not a temporary timeout and then the war picks up again. No. Peace is peace. There's no war at all. Anymore. And the Father wants you and me to understand, because of what my son Jesus did for you, we have peace. So if you're feeling a little guilty, shuck it. Throw it in the trash can. Tell your conscience or the enemy to beat feet because God says, Don doesn't say it, God says we are at peace with our Father in heaven. Amen? Amen. So don't ever forget that. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Question this morning. Do you want peace with God? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Huh? Yes. Do you want peace with God? Yes or no? Yes. Do you want to live forever in a paradise? Yes or no? Yes. Now see, these are simple questions. Do you really want peace with God? Do you want to live forever in a paradise? Yes or no? Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And they follow me, and I give what? Eternal life. I give what? Eternal life. There's that gift again. I gift them eternal life. And they shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. Or he also said in John chapter 3, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. He was talking about being lifted up on that cross. As Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so I have to be lifted up on a wooden pole. In order that everyone who what? Believes in him. May have what? Eternal life. Jesus said the Son of Man has to be lifted up on that pole. I have to die for you. I agree to do that. If you believe in me, I give you eternal life. Is that an unbelievable offer? Yes. Who is it for? Yes. All who will believe. Your job is to tell other people, there is a way for you to live forever. There is a way for you to live forever in paradise. You have to trust that God has made a way for your sins to be paid for. It's nothing you do. It's something Jesus did for you. You've got to make the offer. Now, what they do with the offer is up to them. Just tell them the way that they can live forever.
You want to be right in God's eyes, people? Here's Paul in the 16th chapter of the book of Acts. Remember I told you, it starts in Genesis, goes all the way through. It's everywhere in the Bible. The Roman jailer has, they have been beating Paul and his companions in the city of Philippi. They have thrown them in the stocks in the prison in the city of Philippi. And even after they were whipped and beaten, tortured, the Roman jailer is listening to Paul and his companions. And this makes no sense. They're singing, for heaven's sake. They're singing to God. They're praising some God. What is with these crazy men? A big earthquake happens. There's that shaking again. The prison doors are flung open. The jailer thinks they've all escaped. I'm a dead man. Because if a prisoner escaped on your watch, you were tortured mercilessly until you died. The prison guard is saying, I'm a dead man. And he gets ready to kill himself. And Paul says, hey, don't harm yourself. We're all still here. Now, I want you to think about this. If you've been beaten and tortured in prison, and the doors are suddenly flung open by an earthquake and your chains fall off, what would you do? Run. Huh? <laughs> I'd jackrabbit, wouldn't you? But Paul knows God's doing something. Paul and his companion just sit there. And the jailer is about to kill himself. Paul says, don't harm yourself. We're all here. And he runs in to the jail and he hits his knees before Paul because these guys are still there. They've saved his life. And he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? And that's what Paul told him. What's it say? Did Paul give him the Ten Commandments to be saved? No. Did Paul say you got to go to synagogue once a week? No. Did Paul say you got to worship on Saturdays? Did Paul tell him you have to wear certain clothes? Dress a certain way, shave or not shave. These are all parts of the law. What did they tell the jailer he had to do in order to be saved? There you go. Can God have made it any easier for us? No. So here's my message for you. You hang on to that. You don't let anybody take that away from you. You're going to live forever. No matter what happens in this world, no matter how bad it gets, it doesn't matter. You just hang on to this truth. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came from heaven, lived as a man, and died in your place for your sins. And nobody can get that away from you. And you will live forever. Even if you die, he's going to raise you back up, and you're going to live forever. And the rest of the Bible tells you a lot more about that. Isn't that a phenomenally good message? Yes. Hello? Yes. Everybody take a deep breath. Let's say, Amen. 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 I have been asking these two good looking young ladies here for weeks now to be Christian. And I still haven't got an answer for them. You all want to know the question I've been asking these two young ladies? Yep. <laughs> How do I keep all these old people awake? <laughs> And do you know what they keep telling me every week? I don't know. Yeah, you be stand up. Oh, Father God, how I love your mercy. I thank you, Lord God, for this great plan of salvation that you thought about before there was ever a universe. Thank you, Father God, for sending your son Jesus to die for our sins. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being faithful to the very end. Thank you, Lord, 
for sending the prophets and the apostles to lay all this out for us in thy word. Thank you, Lord, for keeping your word pure for us for all these thousands of years. I thank you, Lord Jesus, because you're going to come back and clean up this mess very shortly. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Okay.